The decision not to use the Michael Myers character was stupid, and why they decided to leave that, I do not know. No, no, I can't prove it. You've got to believe me. Believe me. Take it off the air now, please. There was a horrible backlash. It was crushing for me because, you know, it was perceived as a flop. Our masks. Gather round your TV set. Put on your masks and watch. If it hadn't been called Halloween 3, if it was just called Season of the Witch or some other title, it may have gotten a better reception. Well, take off the third channel, the third channel. It's still running. Stop it, please. For God's sake, please stop it. There's no more time. When I saw it, you know, I thought, well, this is a terrific little scary movie in the tradition. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! But it, yeah, it died a terrible death. It did not. And I've done a number of films like that. Stop it! It's a real riddle how we got to Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. When the concept of Halloween 2 came along, I just hated it. I withdrew from the project. I was in New York when Deborah called me and said, hey, we're going to do Halloween 3. Would you think about being the director? It, it was a godsend because I, I had been worried all along that our pads had just, you know, split and weren't going to get back together ever. Um, and when she said, it's not, it, it's not a real sequel, it's not going to have anything to do with the other two, I went, I'm in. I take no responsibility for Halloween 3 or credit. I had nothing to do with it. They just sent me a nice fat check. Uh, the decision not to use the Michael Myers character was stupid. It was, it was really ill-advised. We now know that Michael Myers is the is the backbone of this whole of this whole franchise, and why they decided to leave that I do not know. I was not consulted. Our thinking makes great sense and is is a real money making idea that everybody somehow just managed to drop the ball, including Universal Studios, and that is this: each year, let's come out with a new movie on the subject of Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, and all that goes with it. It could go in any direction it wants, and each one can spin off any number of their own sequels. Now, tell me, is that not a great fertile idea that could make money for the rest of time? Halloween 3, uh, for me, was um, really sort of fun from the standpoint that it wasn't uh, making a sequel that was a Michael Myers film that we were sort of rehashing. It was in fact uh, an opportunity to create new adventures and visuals that made it enjoyable for me. Halloween 3 is not a knife movie the way Halloween was. Halloween 3 is a pod movie. Halloween 3 owes a lot to the invasion of the body snatchers. I like Tommy Lee Wallace and I thought his contributions to Halloween 1 were, were immeasurable. He, he, he was really, really a very much, very much a part of its success. And I think, you know, this was a reward for, from his friend John Carpenter, who they were boyhood friends, and it's to Carpenter's credit that he, 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 he championed Tommy Lee Wallace. I mean, he was the production designer and the editor. Um, so he was uh, a, a serious contributor to Halloween 1, but also understood the sensibilities of that kind of, you know, suspense filmmaking. And so uh, that to me was very encouraging. He had the same temperament as John and Rick. They're just easy going. He knew what he wanted and he set it up 
this is what we're going to do, fine. I thought he was terrific uh, as a director. He knew what he wanted to get. We went to terrific locations, and he was real easy on, on the set. He did not have the ego that some directors can have, um, and some certainly writer-directors. So he was, he was great to work with. He really was. The soul written by credit on Halloween 3 for the screenplay is just about the most inaccurate credit you could ever conceive of. Nigel Neal, the well-established uh, icon in horror because of his in invention of the Quatermass character in British television and features that had had a lot of mileage. John was a big fan. I think it was John who was instrumental in getting him to come up with a, a screenplay for Halloween 3 based on the concept that Deborah had been promoting which was basically witchcraft meets the computer age. He had had some lousy experiences in Hollywood and from his perception I believe he felt that as a general rule Hollywood had mangled his stuff. And so it's almost like he had a chip on his shoulder. And so when he turned in his screenplay and we read it, any criticism that we gave was going to meet with some resistance, I think. And we did have criticism. It was moody, it was dark, it was fascinating. I loved it. I'd say fully half probably more, 60% of what he did is what that screenplay is. John was the first one who did a rewrite. He may have been surprised that his protege, me, didn't, wasn't all that enamored with what he had done, so I did a rewrite. But anyway, I was the only one with a name on the movie. Uh, so you can see what a ridiculous credit that is. I think there was again this sort of team uh, feeling about it. The fact that we were all going to be working on, on um, a variation, but you know, all of us you know, bringing our own skills and, and artistic sensibilities. I did get the job on Halloween 3 because I had done Halloween 2. I think it's almost the exact same crew. A lot of the same people are on both movies. Because Deborah Hill, you know, remembered us all and they, she was very loyal and she just, you know, said, hey, who wants to do another one? The cast on Halloween 3 um, were completely different. I don't know, your father came into the hospital and he, I thought he was crazy out of his mind. He's hanging onto a Halloween mask, he wouldn't let it go. And what he said was, they're gonna kill us all. And in a little while he was dead. And I don't know what the hell is going on. Tom was already sort of a member of the family. And it was Deborah who suggested Tom. Not your most obvious choice, not a pretty boy, not a youth, but she felt that would be a nice, different way to go, and I completely agreed, so that was easy. Drinking and doctoring, great combination. I didn't feel very much like a medical professional because, I mean, right off the bat, I walk in, I walk into my house and Nancy Loomis is my wife, She's actually Tommy Lee Wallace's wife at the time while we were shooting. And um, I walk out on her and the kids, have a couple of beers and run off with some young chick and head north. I don't know what the hell kind of a doctor I was. <laughs> a classic story, Spanky. Like Tommy Lee Wallace having no ego, um, Tom Atkins the same. He was not like your typical actor who's, you know, all worried about himself and me, me, me. He was as gracious and as charming and as generous an actor as you get to work with. He always took the job seriously, but never took himself seriously. So, so it was always fun, you know, working with him. There are a lot of actors that have been around a long time who choose kind of what they do during their career. And I never really had that luxury. You know, to me, a job was a job. If somebody invited me to play a starring role in a movie, I, hell yeah, I'll do it, I'm there. Is this my father? I was traumatized by seeing The Exorcist when I was a young girl, so I stayed away from horror movies. 
I got a copy of the script and I thought, wow, this is a great part. And uh, I went in to read. John was there, Deborah Hill was there, and Tommy Lee and a couple of other people. And we sat in a room and saw the final three or five girls that they had selected to, to, to narrow it down. And as soon as Stacy walked in, everybody perked up. Literally, as I walked in the door returning from the audition, they offered me the part. I mean, that never happens, <laughs> so, so it was great. What I liked about Ellie was she was a strong girl. She didn't give up. I liked the flirtatious aspect of her. She went for what she wanted, and, uh, and, and she basically got it. <laughs> Except in the end. <laughs> so, um, but she was a strong character, and I like strong female characters. I think we all do. We did one scene together, Stacy and Elk and I. We're coming down the road in the car, and there's, the, the, there's a telephone pole like this, and the camera's shooting this way, and I'm supposed to come and not clip the telephone pole, but go buy it. And then we cut to it, I run into the tree. And I came barreling down the road, came across, wham, I hit the pole, not hard, but enough that she went, eh, <laughs> squeal. And then we went off and everything came off fine. Nobody got hurt. Where do you want to sleep, Dr. Chalice? That's a dumb question, Miss Grimpich. Doing the love scene uh, with Tom, that always stands out because that was my first and only time I've done a scene like that, uh, which uh, I was uh, quite anxious about. But he made me feel so comfortable and he was wonderful. There was a no nipple clause. So they could shoot my breast, but they could not shoot my nipple. Couldn't see this, couldn't see that. Um, so poor Tommy Adkins and Tommy Lee Wallace, you know, you have to shoot around this and he has to cover up here. And these things are so technical. And we spent a lot of time together on that film. Jeez. And then she tried to kill me at the end. What the hell was that about? You don't really know much about Halloween. You thought no further than the strange custom of having your children wear masks and go out begging for candy. Again, it was Deborah's suggestion that we try Dan O'Hurley, and again, just a, a home run. An opportunity to work with uh, an actor like uh, you know Donald Pleasance was on the first one, a professional, somebody you had seen in films before, so he had you know a great deal of credibility. It was interesting because he also brought with him an understanding of the mythology, the Celtic mythology of Samhain. Or Halloween, um, you know, that we were were using. So he he had, um, you know, not only on screen, you know, a presence, but also we felt a sense of authenticity in everything we did because he was there to uh, confirm it. Dan O'Hurley was an extremely talented man. Extremely talented. He helped really make the movie. If his character wasn't as threatening and creepy and maniacal as he was, but with that very smooth exterior, you know, um, the movie would not be what it was. He really, he was an extraordinary actor. And as a human being, he was lovely. I kind of looked up to him, I think, you know. He had been doing it a long time, me not quite so long. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of off-camera time together, but. He was certainly packing all the ammo when he needed to, to be what he, as evil as he was with, the, with an Irish uh, smile on his face. Typical Irish, you know? I've often thought of that. You, you, I've been to Ireland a couple times for visits and, and you go there and, and they're also, hell fellow, well met, hi Yank, have a beer, what do you think, how you doing, all that. And I've always thought that just underneath that smiley surface is someone just waiting to knock you in the face and knock you down <laughs> and then smile over top of you. <laughs> what I want to know is why they put their factory out here in the middle of nowhere. We shot the mystery town, Santa Mira, a little village up in uh, Northern California played the part and it in real life, it's every bit as strange 
as it appears on film. It was such a small, sleepy, quiet town um, that you kind of got the creeps from it because it was one of those where everybody's watching everybody and everybody knows what's going on with everybody. But it had a weird vibe. It really did. You do get this eerie feeling when you go into town that people are behind curtains looking out. We didn't have to stretch very much. We went on location. The site of a paper pulping factory and it is the stinkiest place I've ever been in my life. We did that stuff for days, it felt like nights, a lot of night shoots. And running up the street, down the street, climbing into a window, coming out of a window, going up a ladder, across a roof, jumping down here and doing that. And I, I was sick as a dog. I don't know what I got, but I thought at the time, Jesus, if I had to go up that ladder again, I'm gonna drop dead. And half of it didn't get in the movie. And I thought, I, I love being an actor. <laughs> we thank Don Post for two of the three masks. The witch and the skull already existed. And we collaborated on the pumpkin, the jack-o'-lantern, with Don. But I figured out the rationale for Halloween 3 is that that's what the mask maker is calling these three masks that are being sold in the stores this year. And so somehow I shoehorned that into the, into the whole makeup of the thing, which is just a desperate director wanting to make his movie make sense. When do we get to see him making the mask? Real soon, little buddy. And then there's the whole comic relief of, of there's a family of people that sell these masks that come to the town, and it was like a husband and wife and a kid in, in the Winnebago. That was the most fun I got to have on the movie in terms of clothing. I dressed them to be, you know, as ugly, ugly Americans as I could possibly do, and it really shows. Oh, I want a mask. Can I have a mask? Uh. My role was little buddy, and uh, I was the obnoxious little son. And we were up on a trip, uh, seeing the factory, and that was the last time I watched TV. Honey, don't get too close. You'll ruin your eyes. The death scene, which was, was a fun part, um, they made a mold of my head. So when they were making the mold, they were explaining to me what was going to happen. And as a 12-year-old kid, you know, hearing that snakes and bugs are going to crawl out of your mouth, that's kind of exciting. And they made a mold of my head, and then they reversed the mold. And then they melted it to where the shape of the mouth they wanted me to have. So it was pretty much when the snakes and bugs were coming out, it was a dummy from about here up. The parts where bugs were crawling over, they had like a, a, a stand-in, a stunt person for that. But the mask, when I was ripping it apart, you know, there was only, they only made one mask, so they made sure to do it right. Because that mask, it would fall apart if you, if you gave it some, some, some tug, and that's what I wouldn't, that, that's, that was the part I did. They had all kinds of crickets, but when they would let the crickets go, obviously they couldn't contain all the crickets. So at the end of the shoot, the studio was just, all you heard was just crickets, 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 people were going nuts. So we, once we were done, we were just out of there because my mother, she was like, I can't take it anymore, let's get the hell out of here. We've done perverted things in the name of entertainment and, and uh, kind of ruining the wearing of masks. So, sorry. Stop it, stop it now, turn it off, turn it off. Stop it, stop it, stop it. I think it ended happily. I think they do turn off that final television channel and all the kids of the world are saved. Yeah. You're an optimist. I am. I am. My wife wouldn't agree with that, but I, I think I am. Yeah. Halloween 3 was just take everything you guys know how to do and go for it. Our sound that we had established collectively from Escape from New York and got super imprinted on Halloween 2 and then Halloween uh, and then The Thing a little bit is, the, is the, the palette we made it from. So John really thought we found a great little notch that was Halloween-like, but it wasn't Halloween anymore. So he felt we, we, we successfully did that. And then we just went on from there and whatever we came up with, we came up with on, sort of on the fly. Uh, you know, in fact, I had created the technology, or shaped the technology at the time, so that it was really start the movie and just start playing. So, so John referred to that technology as the electronic coloring book. There's no, no big technical sweat to making these things happen. It got easy. 
he loved, loved the fact that it was easy. All right, roll it. One of the most fun things about Halloween 3 is the silver shamrock theme. Three more days till Halloween. Halloween, Halloween. Three more days till Halloween. Silver shamrock. Oh my God. Just thinking about the song. I can't get it out of my head. Happy, happy Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Happy, happy Halloween, Silver Shamrock. We needed a jingle. No more, no money in the budget to hire some guy to go, hey, make a jingle, please. I remember when De Deborah said, you and Tommy are going to make this theme up. Go ahead. And she says, use the theme from London Bridges Falling Down. So we have no problems with copyrights. That's completely PD. So when you think about it, that's what it is. Da -da 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 -da. But then I went and dialed up this, you know, on my synthesizers, this little oh, bop, 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 silly thing. I think we knocked out the Silver Shamrock commercial in about a week. We generally don't know the music before we try to create something, so we had no idea what the music was going to be. That was a major surprise. I discovered I could uh, do adequate voiceovers uh, or create fake sound effects just for temp work in the cutting room. So I slowed down the tape recorder and Tommy Lee Wallace sang that much like the chipmunks would do. So he had to think, three more days to Halloween. And then you speed up and so the pitch came up and the whole track came up. It turned out that I had a, 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 a certain cheesy radio announcer voice that John liked and uh, used it in Halloween and again in the fog. And, you know, the smooth sound. Uh, K-A-B, which I loved doing. So this was no different. Gather round your TV set, put on your masks, and watch. The big giveaway at nine, you know. Just, I was fast, and I was right there, and I was free. And so, once again, no brainer. <laughs> it's one of those strange, like really graphic images and sound that I think it's basically designed after kind of a commercial jingle that like sticks in your head and then you kind of take it out of the theater and get freaked out about it after you've seen the movie. <laughs> Turn it off. Stop it. I can honestly say I have never done another one like that. Uh, so it, it's a, a very unique highlight of my career. It's, it's, almost it's one kids. wild it's little ticking. moment. Stop it. But it is stuck around, which I think is remarkable. People remember that. You leave the movie and that's going through your head. That maddening, you know, uh, repetitive song. Stop it! The dead might be looking in. Stop it! The world's going to change tonight, Doctor. Happy Halloween. Halloween 3. Season of the Witch. The night no one comes home. First time I saw the final film, I believe, was when we went to Las Vegas. That was a nice little perk. For the, the uh, there was a screening of it, and we were all flown to Vegas for the night. And uh, I believe that was where I saw the film for the first time. When I saw it, you know, I thought, well, this is, uh, it's good, you know, it's a ter terrific little scary movie in, in the tradition, and, but it, yeah, it died a terrible death. <laughs> The, the film did not uh, get a lot of uh, good reviews. <laughs> it did not stay in the movie theaters for longer than maybe a week. Um, it, uh, no, it did not do very well. Sequels are an expectation by the audience of a continuation of the characters they loved. And I think packaging it as presumably a sequel was disappointing to the audience because they had certain expectations. Nobody, and I mean nobody, myself included, did the due diligence thing of making sure the audience knew what was happening. It, required, it would have required a really clever ad campaign, and nobody came up with it. Everybody booed. Where's Michael? Where's Michael? I don't think they had any idea how big this character would get when they decided not to use him again. It says Halloween 3, so where's Jamie Lee? You know, where's the big knife? Where's the shape? 
and you have John Carpenter's name on it, and you have the, uh, the title Halloween. And it was three. It wasn't just Halloween. You know, it was Halloween three. Uh, you know, so it, it had the baggage of, of that it had to drag along of being attached to Halloween one and two. If it hadn't been called Halloween three, if it was just called Season of the Witch or some other title, it may have gotten a better reception. There was a horrible backlash. It was crushing for me because, you know, it was perceived as a flop. And uh, it was the producers who, who said, look, Michael Myers is making us so much money, it's just dumb to forget the anthology thing. And happily, the, uh, for Mustafa Akkad, as it turned out, the sequel rights reverted back to Compass, and there they sat for quite a while before another movie was made. And so at that point, uh, sort of John and Deborah didn't want to play anymore. So I, I have to say I was uh, disappointed, you know, as, as did John and Deborah and everyone involved, that the audience didn't grasp onto it as we had hoped. So we're sort of the bastard child, the black sheep of the family, but that's okay. Thank you all for coming out tonight for Halloween 3. This is so awesome. I know it's basically Halloween tonight and parties and everything, so it's really cool that you guys all came. Um, just I lived for years and years with the certain perception that it had been a failure and that not very many people liked it. I knew I thought it was a good movie, and I knew that John thought it was a good movie, and uh, Deborah. And so that was good enough for me. It hurt that it didn't find an audience, but what can you do? You just have to butch up and uh, go on with your, with your career. Let's uh, bring up the man of the hour here. We got Tommy Lee Wallace right here. <laughs> Writer and director. Yeah. So one thing, I'm never, never quite sure. Is she a robot the whole movie or do they turn her into one at the end? I don't know. <laughs> Why ask me? When I went there and signed some autographs and shook hands and took photographs with people, I had, I, I was flabbergasted at how many people adored Halloween 3 and took it to their hearts and thought it was a fine movie and enjoyed the hell out of it. That was the first inkling I had that anybody cared. I saw it on cable and uh, I always liked it. This movie is its own animal and uh, it's very unique. Uh, lots of kids get killed, it's sort of taboo, you can't do that anymore. It has terrific performances. Dan O'Hurley, he is uh, excellent in the film. Uh, you have amazing cinematography from Dean Cundy, who did The Thing, Escape from New York, Halloween, The Fog. Uh, so he's one of the best in town. Happy Halloween. I think recently, uh, there's been kind of a re-interest in Halloween 3. Um, I think a uh, sort of a rediscovery, re-appreciation. You know, it found itself, audiences found it. When I meet people that ask about it, they all pretty much seem to really like it and enjoy it. It's amazing that 30 years later, it's, it's, it's snowballed with all these fans and it's become this cult classic. It's, that's extraordinary to me. The popularity, it's kind of, it's interesting. I think it's fascinating that this still has a following. I often get letters with a picture of myself and they want me to sign as, a, as an autograph. Um, a friend of mine went on eBay and he typed my name and found that, <laughs> this is really funny, that one of the signed autograph pictures is on eBay for five bucks. It's nice to see that uh, our efforts are not going unnoticed or unrewarded. So very gratifying, very healing experience for me to, to see it through all these years and have it kind of finally find its audience and shine a little bit. I'm tickled that I got to make Halloween 3 and work with Tommy Lee and John and Deborah again and, and Stacy. 
I'm very proud to be part of it and proud to uh, have been in it. And I love that people get the movie now because there were there was a there were a lot of smarts behind the movie. It's it's a, it's a good memory. It's a very good memory. And it's uh, once in a while when I need to like pull strings and like get into like you know big theaters and you know like VIP lounges, I say you know what, dude, I was I was in Halloween three, so and it works every time I get right in. It's it's quite quite fun now. I think the, as a standalone movie, Halloween three is fine. It's it's a good production. The story works. It has its shock value. It's, it's a great little movie on its own. It's a standalone film. Don't judge it by Michael Myers with or without. Just watch it for its for its own content. And it's a pretty good little movie. Now, in retrospect, you look back at it, and it has its own charm. And and in spite of the fact that it wasn't, you know, as successful, um, to me it was that was okay because um, you know I enjoyed you know, my adventure on, on Halloween 3. It has slowly but surely accumulated that annual audience that loves Halloween, that loves the season, and loves the movie. So it's been very gratifying to, to notice that the, the fans are legion. They're out there. So thanks, fans. I'm really happy about that. Happy, happy Halloween. It's almost time, kids. The clock is ticking. Be in front of your TV sets for the horathon, and remember the big giveaway at nine. Don't miss it, and don't forget to wear your masks. The clock is ticking. It's almost time. Happy, happy Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Happy, happy Halloween, Super Shamrock. Happy, happy Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Happy, happy Halloween, Super Shamrock. Thank you.